Ah, video games. Is there any better way to waste an afternoon? I say no. Provided they're not outright lying to me, that is. Wait, what? That's right. Your favorite video games deceive you literally all the time. From stats that mean absolutely nothing to hidden features developers don't want you to know about, here are some of the most insane ways video games lie to you. Need more speed. Every video game ever has what we call mechanics. Whether they're as simple as reloading a weapon or as complex as building a base, all of these features are mechanics. Sometimes, however, games present us with a mechanic that doesn't actually do anything at all, and you don't even realize it. Take speed boosts. In some games, like the original Mass Effect, sprinting does, well, literally nothing. If you're in combat, sure, it works just fine, but if you're traversing the world, pushing the sprint button doesn't affect your speed at all. It just brings the camera closer and changes your character's animation to give the impression that you're moving faster. In reality, there's no difference in the speed of these two videos. This odd decision was probably due to technical limitations. The hardware the game released on back in 2007 was nowhere near as powerful as today's, so the devs had to force the player to move slowly in order to give the game time to load. But this fake mechanic isn't limited to third-person shooters. Many racing games have a boost or nitro button, which is supposed to give your car a crazy speed increase to help overtake your rivals. However, in titles like Need for Speed, the boost barely increases your speed at all. There's a load of intense visual effects and the field of view gets closer to the car, which makes it feel like you're going at the speed of sound. But you guessed it, in reality, the change is minimal to downright non-existent. It's all just smoke and wing mirrors. Mind Games Some games, particularly psychological horrors, excel at screwing with a player's mind. Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem, thrives on it. This 2002 GameCube horror title follows several characters across different time periods as they contend with ancient Lovecraftian evils. So far, so standard. But where the game really stands out is in its sanity mechanic. The more your character is damaged by enemies, the more their sanity meter will deteriorate, causing increasingly bizarre and unnerving things to happen, including the game downright lying to you to mess with your head, like triggering a fake blue screen error message to pop up. Yikes. And if you think that sounds panic-inducing, it gets worse. If you're doing particularly badly, the game will pretend to delete all your save data right before your eyes. Oh man, that's the true horror right there. Seriously, imagine not realizing this was part of the game. Some players literally went to unplug their consoles before their data could be deleted. And the lies don't stop there. The devious devs behind Eternal Darkness also incorporated features where the game pretends to lower the volume on your TV, switch inputs, or even turn off the screen entirely. With all this going on, it'd be hard not to feel at least a little unnerved. After all, there's nothing worse than feeling like the horror is extending past your device and into your home. At least until- Ah, uh, just kidding. I'm not going anywhere. If you want to keep your sanity meter healthy though, I recommend you go and hit those like and subscribe buttons. That way, you'll never miss out on any mind-blowing videos like this one. Okay, back to the deception. Just made it. Is there anything more terrifying than a red health bar? No, there isn't. But there's no better feeling than surviving a nail-biting encounter with just a sliver of life left, right? This is something game developers know, which is why they lie to you about it. What? Yep, a lot of the time, devs make that last little fraction of a health bar worth more HP than the rest of it. So when you think you've only got 10% of your health left, it might actually be around 40%. 
Games like Doom Eternal and Assassin's Creed Origins do this specifically to ramp up the tension and give you more barely-made-it moments. Damn, that's kind of cool, I guess, but it makes me doubt every level I've ever completed. In a similar vein, other games like 1994's System Shock give the last bullet in your magazine double damage. This makes it more likely you'll get a desperate kill in the nick of time, ramping up the drama. And its 2007 spiritual successor Bioshock outright makes you invulnerable for a couple seconds when your health gets low enough. Wait, am, am I bad at video games after all? I need to lie down. Timer Trouble I don't perform well under pressure. If a timer's ticking away, I start to sweat, especially when that timer seems to be going suspiciously quickly. Ever notice when you play Mario that the countdown timer goes from 90 to 30 in what feels like half the time? No, you aren't losing it. Mario seconds are faster. The exact time differs from game to game, but a Mario second is usually only around 0.6 real seconds. No wonder I get so panicked. But why is that? Well, it's probably partly to stress out players like me, but it could also just be a technical quirk. See, the original NES console that the first Mario was released on couldn't keep time in seconds. So instead, the game used a shorter measure of time and it kind of just stuck. I'm still unconvinced though. I reckon Mario's creator, Shigeru Miyamoto, just wanted to make us suffer while laughing in our faces. Pocket Monster Mishaps Everyone's heard of Pokemon. But did you know that despite its insane popularity, the original Pokemon games, 1996's Red and Green, literally lie to your face? Yeah, back then, developer Game Freak was a tiny studio that had a nightmarish time trying to fit all the data on that little Game Boy cartridge. Because of this, the first game shipped with a ton of bugs and broken mechanics. The battle system proved especially difficult for the team to nail. After years of tinkering, it was only just finished in time. And finished is an overstatement. Some moves just don't do what they claim to. Focus energy is supposed to increase your monster's critical hit rate, allowing them to hit harder. But whoops, it actually cuts it dramatically. Right. Plus, Psychic-type Pokémon were supposed to be weak to ghost moves, but instead, they're completely immune to them. As you might imagine, this is pretty damn infuriating when you're trying to tactically win a battle. But the battle system isn't the only fibber. Originally only released in Japan, in 1998, the first Pokemon games were published in the rest of the world as the updated red and blue versions. And these new versions had their own issues, most notably, kids who traded their Raichu to a guy on Cinnabar Island were shocked to read that their Pokemon had evolved. Why? Because Raichu can't evolve. The game was straight up lying. So what happened this time? Well, in the original Japanese game, this trade required the player to send over a Kadabra, which would then evolve into Alakazam. In the new version, they changed the monster needed to a Raichu, but not the text that displays afterwards, making it seem like Raichu had evolved when it hadn't. See, this is why I have trust issues. Don't look behind you. If you like your horror games, you've probably heard of Silent Hills, Hideo Kojima's tragically cancelled Silent Hill reboot. Well, its 2014 playable teaser, PT, is widely regarded as one of the scariest games ever made. While it harbors a chilling secret most people don't know about, the gameplay itself is fairly simple. You walk down an eerie hallway exploring and solving puzzles, while a terrifying ghost called Lisa stalks you. Sometimes you'll hear sobbing and ragged breathing coming from behind you. Top tip, don't turn around if you do. Jeepers. Thing is, even when Lisa isn't making any noise, many gamers still found themselves feeling like they were being watched, like all the time. To get to the bottom of this, a hacker named Lance McDonald went trawling through the game's code, and he found something super eerie. 
Turns out, as soon as you grab the flashlight at the start of the game, Lisa secretly attaches herself to your back. By locking the camera into one position, McDonald captured this in all its creepy glory. She's literally always breathing down your neck. You just don't realize it. Ooh. This enabled the devs to replicate the uncanny feeling of being watched and boost the scare factor while keeping the gamer none the wiser. Unfortunately for the masochists out there, the teaser was pulled from the PlayStation Store when Silent Hills was cancelled. I'd quite like to sleep tonight though, so that's just fine with me. Doki Doki Danger Man, after all that horror, I need to unwind. How about an adorable looking anime game? 2017's Doki Doki Literature Club presents itself as a cutesy dating sim that allows the player to romance one of four anime girls. Only, when you first boot the game up, it displays this ominous warning. Seems totally out of place, right? Well, it's not. Despite the cute exterior, Doki Doki is actually a very disturbing psychological horror game that wears a dating sim as a skin suit. If you don't want any of the plot spoiled, I'd skip ahead now because it's really something best experienced for yourself. The basic gist involves one of the girls becoming self-aware and falling in love with the player. Not the avatar, but you in the real world. She then breaks the fourth wall and uses the game's code to influence and torment the other girls, hoping to make them unlovable to you. Sure, the game gives you a small, non-specific warning about what's to come, but nothing can prepare you for when it goes totally off the rails. I can't go into detail here without risking getting demonetized, which should tell you all you need to know. Put it this way, if you're looking for a game that'll give you the fuzzies, this ain't it. Living on the Edge Platforming games like Mario or Rayman are all about control. They need to feel tight and responsive, or you'll get frustrated fast. But to accomplish this, devs have some seriously sneaky tricks up their sleeve. The most shocking? Those platforms that you're running along are longer than they appear. Eh? Huh? In pretty much every good platforming game, you get a few extra frames to jump after running off a ledge. This mechanic is known as Coyote Time, after the Looney Tunes character Wile E. Coyote. You know, he'd run off a cliff and stay suspended in the air for a few seconds before plummeting to the ground. You might think this deception would make all platformers feel too easy, but the reality is it makes them feel normal. Most people don't have lightning-fast reaction times and need those extra few frames to time the jump properly. In fact, any time a platformer doesn't include coyote time, it's painfully noticeable. 2017's remastered Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy drastically reduced the amount of coyote time it allowed players compared to the original trilogy, and people struggled. So this is one helping hand that I'm more than happy to get. Better Than One Ridley Scott's Alien movies gave me nightmares for years. Even today, I still can't eat eggs in case something jumps out of them. So imagine my horror when Alien Isolation released in 2014 and brought the experience of being hunted relentlessly by an unstoppable xenomorph into the video game realm. Naturally, I just had to play it. The brutal beastie is always present in the game, learning and adapting based on how you play. But as I played, I kept feeling like it was getting way too close for comfort, even though I hadn't made any noise to alert it. Well, it turns out there's more going on than the devs first claimed. See, the Xenomorph actually has two AI brains. The main one controls the monster and learns from your behavior as it attempts to hunt you down. The second brain, known as the Director, is the one you're not supposed to know about. This brain always knows exactly where you're hiding and occasionally feeds clues to the main alien AI if you're doing too well. Say what? That hardly seems fair. Yeah, and that's not all. The Xenomorph also has, quite literally, eyes in the back of its head, so it can tell if you creep up too close behind it. Jeez. 
There are all sorts of processes like this going on, creating the illusion of a sophisticated alien intelligence, when in reality, it's a bit of a cheat. You can't deny its effectiveness, though. I had to buy a whole new drawer of underwear after completing this game. Bare-faced liars. By now, it should be pretty clear that game developers don't shy away from deceiving gamers. But often they'll do so quite subtly. Well, not in the case of Telltale. If you've ever played one of their games, you'll know that whenever you make any kind of decision, a message has a chance to pop up saying that a particular character will remember it. It's supposed to add weight to your choice and make you dread any potential plot consequences. The reality is, there often aren't any consequences. The plot remains unchanged and the character in question reacts to you much the same as if you'd made a different decision. The message is purely superficial, which is outrageous considering the whole point of their game is choices and consequence. Even so, this is far from the most egregious offense. 1995's racing game High Octane has one of the most barefaced lies in video game history. As with most racers, the player can choose between various different cars, each with different stats, you know, speed, acceleration, all that good stuff. Only in High Octane's case, these stats are astronomical fibs. In reality, none of the vehicles have any discernible differences whatsoever. They all perform the exact same. That's beyond lazy. Gaslighting your players because you can't be bothered to implement real changes is some pretty scummy practice. Having said that, not all blatant falsehoods are bad. 2017's Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice follows the titular Senua as she goes on a journey to save the soul of her departed lover. At the start of the game, the player is told that a dark rot will spread up Senua's arm every time she responds, and if it reaches her head, all your progress will be lost. Yeesh, a permadeath system? That's rough. But it's also a complete fabrication. No matter how many times the player fails, the rot will never reach Senua's head. So why even say it will? Well, one of the game's main themes is fear and paranoia, particularly the fear of death. To instill this fear in the player, the devs added the permadeath message, but they didn't really want you to lose all your progress and potentially quit the game. So they didn't actually implement the mechanic. The message alone is enough to make every second of gameplay that much more intense. Damn. Have you played Hellblade? If so, did the permadeath lie affect your experience? Let me know down in the comments. Rubber Banding Ever notice that when you're doing really well in a game like Mario Kart, your AI opponents suddenly seem to speed up and start hitting you with everything they've got? Well, it's not just in your head. Some competitive games have a controversial mechanic built into them called rubber banding. Basically, the better you do at the game, the harder the AI becomes in order to keep it feeling challenging. In Mario Kart, this means the overall speed of your opponents will be increased if you're too far ahead of the pack, leveling out the odds. Conversely, if you're doing poorly, their speed is decreased and you have better odds of getting good power-ups. It's designed to stop players getting too frustrated if they're losing and to keep the game interesting if they're winning. But it's been heavily criticized by some people. See, rubber banding often just makes it feel like nothing you do in the game really matters. If you're punished for doing well, what's the point? And if you snatch a win from the jaws of defeat, can you really be proud knowing that the game has basically handed it to you? Hmm. Now you finally understand why I always stay firmly in last place. Hero or Villain Everybody loves a twist. Nothing beats a plot reveal that can make you reevaluate everything you thought you knew about a story. But what if that twist brings into question all of your own actions? 2008's indie darling Braid presents exactly that scenario. In this charming platformer, you play as a character called Tim, seeking out a princess who's been kidnapped by a horrible and evil monster. That seems simple enough, until the player arrives at the final world, that is. See, Braid has a funky time reversal mechanic, and the last level actually takes place first in the story's timeline. 
When you begin the final level, Tim follows the princess and works with her to try and stop an evil knight from pursuing her. Only after reaching her house, the level plays in reverse, and it's revealed that Tim was the evil monster the princess had been fleeing from the whole time. She was rushing to the knight for help, not fleeing from him. Damn. I know I said I love a twist, but it's not fun realizing you were the bad guy all along. Imagine finishing Mario and finding out that the Big M was actually a sadistic monster trying to kidnap Peach. Yeah, there'd be a whole generation of traumatized children. Sorry, not sorry. A different perspective. First-person shooters are one of the most popular gaming genres around. Is there anything more immersive than fighting a battle through the eyes of a soldier? Probably not, just so long as you don't look too closely. And that's because you don't just see through the eyes of the soldier, you shoot through them too. Wait, what? No, I hear you say. You can clearly see the bullets come out of the gun. Ha, that's what they want you to think. Ever noticed another player drop you from behind a box or something when only their head was visible? Infuriating, isn't it? And impossible if they'd actually shot from their gun. See, it's really difficult to program bullets emerging from the barrel of a gun and lining up accurately with a crosshair in the middle of the screen. Usually the bullets will hit a little off-center and the player would have to compensate for this. Repeatedly missing your foes despite having them dead in your sights doesn't sound like fun, does it? So the most elegant solution is to have the bullets fire invisibly from the player's head, straight down the camera while fake, visible bullets fire from the gun. Now, not all games do this, but ones that don't are few and far between. So next time you load up Call of Duty, just find the coziest hiding spot you can and poke your laser eyes of death over the edge. Thank me later. A little help? There's nothing fun about losing, something game devs know all too well. So some will secretly make adjustments under the hood to lessen the blow of failure and keep you playing for as long as possible. Both Spyro the Dragon and Resident Evil 4 can dynamically reduce the challenge in their levels based on the player's performance. For example, if you end up failing loads of times at a certain point, the game might remove some of the enemies in the area you're struggling in, all without you ever being told. In other games like Bioshock, the devs do their best to prevent frustration from the outset. The menacing big daddies have their run speed reduced when you aren't looking at them, to avoid confusing off-camera deaths. On top of that, enemies with ranged weapons will always miss their first shots, to give the player a chance to react without being blindsided. Other shooters like Spec Ops The Line do this too, and although it's unconfirmed whether bigger games like Call of Duty harbor the feature, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, it makes sense. No matter how good you get, getting shot in the back without warning will never be fun. But what about those players that just aren't good? Well, in some multiplayer games like Gears of War, new players are given significant boosts to their stats for their first few kills. See, devs figured out that players who performed poorly in their first match were unlikely to play again, so they made it easier but only for a little while. A few matches in and the playing field would be leveled. In a similar vein, some games, like modern Call of Duty titles, use a skill-based matchmaking system in their multiplayer. The idea is to match players of a similar skill together. That way, gamers are likely to get a few kills and not have their asses handed to them by a more skilled player. Unfortunately, this system also leads to more boring matches. If you improve at the game, you're just paired with better people, so it never seems like you're actually honing your skills. Man, I miss old Call of Duty. Luckily, other devs have employed better tactics to make their games more fun. 2016's XCOM 2 is a turn-based strategy game where soldiers fight aliens. Each attack you make has an accuracy percentage. The higher the percentage, the greater your chance of hitting. The devs rightfully realize that it's not fun to miss an attack with an 85% accuracy rating, so the game secretly boosts the accuracy of these moves to 95%. Feels good, right? And some LEGO games play similar tricks. 
In massive firefights, the game only allows a handful of the enemies to reliably hit you with their projectiles. All the rest are just there to make the scene feel more chaotic. They'll still fire at you, but never actually hit. Man, it really makes you think, are you playing the game or is the game playing you? I Spy I love open world games, but what if I told you that mountain you can see in the distance utterly ceases to exist when you look in any other direction? Now, hear me out. Modern games can be big, and it takes a whole lot of processing power to render massive, detailed game worlds, forcing developers to come up with tricksy solutions. Take 2017's Horizon Zero Dawn, a huge and groundbreakingly beautiful open-world game for its time. So beautiful, in fact, that the devs couldn't actually render it. At least, not all at once, anyway. Instead, they used a neat little trick called frustrum culling. It might sound like a horrid form of body modification, but it's really a genius technique for rendering hefty game worlds. The basic idea is everything you look at gets fully rendered, while everything outside of your field of vision doesn't. Then, as you turn around to face the other direction, the new areas are generated quickly just out of sight, and the old ones are removed. This saves your console from having to load the whole world at once, enabling silky smooth performance without sacrificing on graphical fidelity. Sneaky. So yes, in many games, anything you can't see literally doesn't exist. The only thing behind you is a cold, uncaring void of computer code. Jeez. Way to kill the vibe. Having said that, being able to turn away from somebody and erase their existence would be pretty useful in real life sometimes. After all this time, we'd like to officially introduce you to myself, Jay, and Wesley. We are the narrators here at Be Amazed. But we also know you guys tend to have a favorite for certain videos and topics. So, are you Team Wesley or Team Jay? Please click on the poll in the description to let me know. Man, all this gaming talks made me want to kick back on the couch and turn my console on. Maybe I'll just uh, stick to Tetris, though. And that game can't lie to me, right? Which of those devious deceptions surprised you the most? Let me know in the comments below, and thanks for watching.